not joining? No, he he's not here for this one. He oh, uh, not? yeah, he scratched today. Yeah, well, he's he's a he's he works in the uh, post office, so he's oh really working his working his balls off right now. But we'll have to uh, we'll, for it. Yeah, <laughs> welcome back to another episode of Drop the Mitts Hockey Podcast, brought to you in partnership by Primetime Productions. We have a very special guest coming off a Chicklets Cup victory. Uh, the one, the only Johnny Lazarus. How you doing, buddy? What's going on, Chris? Good to be here. And uh, had I known I'd be introed as a Chicklets Cup champion, I would have had the jersey behind me. But uh, <laughs> it's in the drawer right now, tucked away. But thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. Of course, man. Yeah, dude, talk to us about that tournament. Like, I, you know, obviously we've heard the Empty Netters boys talk about it. Um, you you talked really highly about that whole tournament. It looked like an absolute blast. Uh, what was it like out there in Buffalo? Yeah, I mean, first off, it's like, you know, as, as a 27-year-old, you know, it's rare to have a weekend where you're just like at the rink the whole time. Like I really felt like I was 12 again, which is honestly the best part. Like say what you will about like, you know, all the personalities that were there, the drinking, the fun, the activities and whatnot. But just like, you know, being in your gear, like all day, Friday, all day, Saturday, just kind of shooting the shit, hanging out at the rink. Like, you know, I, I missed that. I didn't realize that I missed that. Um, so that was really cool. And then, you know, obviously playing with, uh, Chris and Dan, as well as the hockey guys and my buddy, Steph Cantali from, from Mercy years, we played together in college. Um, you know, just a, a fun group. And, uh, you know, obviously we were all there to, to win and have fun. And, you know, it's cool that we had the, the content side of it as well. So like, we'll have the videos and stuff forever to remember it. So, um, yeah, no, great weekend, great guys. And, uh, kudos to the Chicklets crew for putting on that event because, um, you know, obviously the weather in Buffalo wasn't, you know, ideal. It rained like both mornings, but, yeah. um, you know, even with the rain or shine, like it was still, you know, a, a really fun event and a lot of people came out and, and had a good time and the weather actually did end up getting pretty good, I think in the afternoons, but, um, yeah, overall just an absolute blast. And if anyone hasn't been, I, I highly recommend going to the next one. Dude, yeah. So Chris and Dan were actually, they were talking about, I think it was on their last pod and they were talking about like how everyone was taking it like pretty seriously. Like, yeah, it wasn't just on a, two teams actually. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Dude, so I know, like from uh, here in Mass, they have a team, the the Nose Face Killer. He's he's yeah. from like literally like ten minutes away from us. Yeah, he's uh, a really cool guy. I got the chance to yeah. talk to him a little bit. Um, he's unbelievable. Nice. Uh, hockey ice hockey skills are yeah, but he's a he's a hell of a ball hockey player. Well, dude, uh, that ball hockey is like insane i yeah, i always dude. like you know i'm not the toughest guy in the world don't get me wrong yeah. but i always thought like you know i could handle anything i watched them play for like 10 minutes and i was like no chance am i ever playing that game like dude. no padding shorts t-shirt no helmet blocking clap bombs <laughs> like just just chaos and, and and i don't think like a lot of people don't understand like you know that are not like avid players or whatever like it's literally night and day difference to me at least like between ball hockey and ice hockey like oh yeah. I, rem I remember playing ball hockey dude and i'd be just like fucking tripping over my own feet and like i'm like i can't do this shit so i gave it up yeah. but just yeah. watching some of these kids like their hands are just like unbelievable but did you did you get to play against like the chicklets boys at all or how was the, no. how was the competition for you guys uh, we played roller B on our team. And I also played roller a with some buddies from long Island. Um, and, and, and there wasn't like a major difference between roller a and roller B, but I would say, you know, roller hockey is so different from, from anything because it's not like, it's not like go, go, go. It, it's like very much like possession focus where you can like, you know, if you have a two on two rush, you don't <laughs> even need to like try and score. You can curl back and set it up and just regroup and, you know, try to make your own numbers happen. So that was what I was trying to explain to our guys. Like, um, you know, we were mostly like an ice hockey group, so everyone got the puck and just wanted to go straight. But like in roller, like it's really about taking your time, like settling the puck down. Like I remember in our second game in roller A, like we had the puck on our sticks for three minutes before we even took a shot. Like yeah. it's all about just picking and choosing your seams and and when to attack and when to sit back. And um, that was something I had to explain to our team like the entire weekend. But you know, roller is so chill and so fun, and you know, obviously you have to give effort, but like. If anyone like hasn't played roller that's interested in doing it, it is so much fun. I, I love roller hockey. But think, the competition was was really strong. I thought. I think it was one of the first clips either you posted or Chris or Dan posted, and it just exactly what you just said, just kind of like being patient, like waiting for a seam. You went D to D. I think it was a goal you scored. Actually, I couldn't really tell who scored the goal, but yeah, it was exactly that. It was a D to D pass, and then you took it up the seam, I believe, and then just mm -hmm. kind of took it to the net, and that was it. And, Trying to uh, think of that one, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't remember who it was. I couldn't really tell. I, I mean, <laughs> man, it looked like a well drawn up play. But um, yeah, we. I kind of wanted to get into you know talking about especially your you know your writer for Hockey News um, covering the Rangers. 
Um, and they've been a really interesting team thus far, um, as far as like starting off really hot. And then obviously last night, um, you know, with Nashville, a little bit different. Um, what, what are your expectations for this Rangers team this year? I mean, obviously it's a little bit different from last year, losing Patty Kane, um, losing Tarasenko. What are your, what are your expectations for this team? And to caveat off that, are there any players um, other than the obvious ones that you think could really make some noise for this team and, and really make an impact? Well, I'd say expectations, you know, I, I think last night it's a total wash um, just because my expectation for them is to pretty much be way more competitive than they have been. And and it didn't show last night. There was like no compete level. And I think Lavi let, you know, spoke to that pretty clearly after the game. But, um, you know, I, I think the Rangers have all the talent in the world to, to be as good as anyone in the league. It's just a matter of their compete level. Um, and obviously team speed has a lot to do with that as well. Like they're a little bit of a step behind, you know, from the elite skating teams in the NHL, like I'd say Edmonton, um, you know, New Jersey, uh, Carolina, the three that come to mind as far as just yeah. up and down speed go. But, you know, I, I think Shesterkin obviously didn't, you know, play his best last night. But I think when he's at the top of his game, like, you know, the Rangers, to me, I, I said they're ceiling this year is like an Eastern Conference final appearance. I don't see them winning the East. But, um, you know, I, I think it, it could go from anywhere between them losing in the first round to them getting to the Eastern Conference final. Like, I don't. Again, I don't see them winning the cup this year. I think it, this is a you know a, a grace period season where next year I think you kind of figure out what you have in the room, and they know what they have in the room too. But under Laviolette, it's going to take some time to adjust, right? So yeah, for sure, uh, I've been saying that this year is like a trial run, and, and next year is like you know I, I think they're back on that cup watch. Um, and as far as the players, I think that can uh, you know aside from the obvious like Panarin, Fox, Zibanejad, Shostak, and I would say are the four obvious ones, right? And Kreider, you can throw in there as well, right? Um, you know, I, I had a lot of high expectation for Capo Caco. Um, and I know everyone talks about that, and that's kind of an obvious one too. Uh, but he had an unbelievable preseason, like looked insanely confident, and I think has been held pointless through the first four games. So that's been a bit of a surprise. Uh, with that said, I still think his ceiling this year is very high because he's going to get first line minutes the entire year from what it seems like with Saban, Jad, and Kreider. Um, and then other guys, you know, that I would think can – have an impact you know will cooley has been strong so far in his rookie yeah. season or full rookie season i guess and um you know heedle to me getting that second line center role uh you know i i thought he could put up 30 this year he still hasn't scored he had one in columbus but he got called back um so heedle I, he's he's looked good yeah. you know a really strong skater he just hasn't been able to find the back of the net yet at least one that's counted um and i know i'm, I'm kind of now rambling on because i could talk about the whole team for hours no but, yeah it's all good um, man you know, I got to talk about my boy, Lexi Lafayette. Of course. I got to throw him in there. Yeah. Um, and he had a really great first game. Hasn't looked as strong since. But, uh, you know, I'm sure he'll get back to it. And, you know, last night was a dud, but I'm sure Laviolette will fire them up for the next one. Yeah, that was – and honestly, that was part of my – the big question I wanted to ask you is, do you think Capo Caco and Ella Lafreniere have their breakout years this year? I mean <laughs> – I mean, I mean, man, we three hope, years, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, and but like honestly, I think I think people are so fast to call these kids busts, right? Like, I just and they they don't look at the the whole picture. I don't necessarily think that they were put in positions to really succeed beforehand. But do you think this is the year that they kind of come into their own and have that breakout year? Um, and, and if so, what are some numbers? You know point wise that you could you know goal and point wise uh that you can predict from these guys so from what i see right now i would never call them busts but i also would be you know rel relatively confident in saying that i don't see them like ever being 90 point 100 point players like which is what a one and two you know should amount to at some point hypothetically um, yeah but i think a lot of that has to do with like you know, you watch Lafreniere and Kako play and they're never really like, I don't want to say they're not intense, but they don't play with a ton of urgency. They're always looking to make the skill play and, and make the creative play, which is good, which is what you want. You want your players right. to be creative. But at times I'm like, just shoot that puck. Just get that to the net. Right. Like make the simple play, which they're capable of. Um, you know, I thought Lafreniere had some good looks last night. He came down the right side at one point and, you know, kind of lifted his leg like a fake shot and went across the, the Royal Road there to Panarin, who had a good chance on Saros, but couldn't finish. Um, but you just want to see those two have a little bit more hunger, I'd say, like around the net and, um, you know, thinking shot first because Kako's shot's pretty strong. Lafreniere has shown his shot at times can be really strong as well. They just don't, for whatever reason, just don't have that mentality of like, 
get this thing on net. And, and I think maybe that'll click yeah. at some point. But, um, you know, I think that's one thing that they're lacking right now. Yeah. They, and honestly, I, I got a chance to watch them uh, last night, too. And I I agree with you. I don't think they're cup ready this year. They are going to have a few players that are definitely up for awards. I mean, I have Shesterkin winning the Vesna. Um, Fox taking home the, the Norris. I think those are two probably. Clean sweep, huh? Yeah. I, and honestly, I just the way Adam Fox plays, man, and obviously he's a Harvard kid. So, like, we kind of knew about him beforehand, like, before he came into the NHL. Like, he was actually pretty underrated in college. Oh, I mean, yeah. Not a lot of people talked about him. Um, talk to us about, about his game, man, because a lot of people just see him for, like, his points and whatever, you know, the Norris trophy that he won. And But talk to us about his game because he is – I think he is neck and neck with Kale McCarr, to be honest. Um, so in, I, I strongly disagree there. I strongly you do. Disagree. Yeah. I, I love I, his game, dude. No, no, I'm, I'm not saying yeah. you know, Kale blows Foxy out of the water. You yeah. Know, I, play, I play with both. So like I've yeah. seen, I've seen them up close and I think, you know, the, the comparison I've made it and I didn't come up with it. Like uh, Greg Carville was the first one to ever say that Kale is the McDavid of the blue line. Um, his explosiveness and yeah. his ability to create opportunity on his own, I think is unmatched in the NHL. Foxy is more like the Crosby of the blue line where he sees the ice almost better than anyone. And he thinks the game a step, a step ahead, everyone. And I think Foxy just creates so much for the people around him yeah. where kale can create a lot more on his own. And then don't get me wrong. I think kale, you know, obviously is, is a phenomenal playmaker too, but I think, Foxy's brain is what separates him. And I mean this in like the nicest way. This is like a compliment. It, it, it comes off negative, but it's a compliment. Right. You watch Adam Fox play a men's league game. He looks exactly the same as he does in the NHL. Everything right. is just cool, calm, collected. He never panics. He's like the most relaxed defenseman I've ever seen play hockey. Yeah. And I think that's why he's also so effective because it's so hard to rattle him. You can forecheck him. He's still going to hang on to the puck for that extra second or two, make a head fake, and then make the right play. Yeah. Um, and that's not in comparison to Kale. That's just something that separates Foxy is his patience and his poise and the way he thinks. But again, I, I think if you put like Kale and Foxy on the San Jose Sharks, Kale's probably putting up more points than Adam is because Kale yeah, can do sure. it a little bit more on his own, whereas Foxy like makes those around him even that much better. Um, so I think that's the biggest difference with the two is just you know physical differences. Um, but their their thinking I think is on the same level. I wouldn't say yeah. like. Kale is, you know, a tier ahead of Adam, but they're just like everyone compares them as these like they're not the same at all, in my opinion. Um, yeah. But also, like I didn't even talk about their defensive play. They're both very strong defensively. I just think when you talk about their offensive ability, Adam, I would say, is more, you know, can set up anyone around like can set up all other four guys at any moment, whereas Kale like can just get a breakaway out of nowhere. Yeah, dude. dude and like. I what's crazy about it is I don't I don't really remember Kale in I do a little bit obviously I, I wasn't watching a ton at that time mm -hmm. but obviously you had a pretty close up of him like even in college and now obviously we see what he what you know what he is um do you like do you looking back on it do you think that there should have been no doubt like being a number one pick like, like I think it's easy for us now to be like oh how did this dude not go number one like how did he and yeah he slipped a four which mm -hmm is not by no means a fucking like slouch, you know, he's not a slouch, but like, what is, what are, I try to think about like what these teams look at and, and how you look at a guy like Kale McCarr and he's not a clear cut number one pick. Well, I think the knock on him and, and no disrespect to the AJHL, it was just the league he was playing in. Like yeah. he was putting up sick numbers. Don't get me wrong, but I think there just wasn't enough, uh, at the time, like credibility in that league. Like, I, I think he was like the first ever, like first round pick to come out of that league or something. So yeah, I think that had a lot to do with it. Um, you know, obviously his game speaks for itself. Like he's gotten a lot better as the years have gone on, but he's still been the same player for the most part. But I, I think it was just, you know, <clears throat> taking a chance on a kid coming out of the AJHL. He never played like, you know, right. uh, tier one or, or like major junior a or whatever they call it in Canada. I'm not sure. But, you know, AJHL, I think is technically like tier two junior hockey. So I think that was probably the big question mark was like, can he do this with the best of the best? Right. Um, so I kind of wanted to go back into like, you know, the rookies and stuff and the young guys in the league right now. Um, obviously, everyone is fucking talking about Connor Bedard, right? Yeah. It's, it's like not today. 
Leo uh, Carlson's talking today. Oh my god, man! I and I saw that one live. I went to I went to Dave Chappelle last night at uh, oh, really? at the guard. Oh, it was a riot, dude! Mm-hmm. And uh, luckily, when I got home, the Bruins game and the Ducks were on. So I was, I'm like, fuck yeah! I'm, I'll watch Leo Carlson play. He's unbelievable, dude. Mm-hmm. Like he, I think a lot of people were knocking him, being like, how the fuck did this dude go number two and not Adam Fantilli? You know. And understandably so, Adam Fantilli is the you know the reigning Hobie Baker winner. Had an unreal year at Michigan, but man, who are some of the who some of the rookies that are in you know especially in this class? Mentioned the obvious Connor Bedards, but who are your top three rookies you'd say that are going to really make a you know make a run for the Calder Trophy that aren't Connor Connor Bedard? Yeah, I mean, I had Levi as my Rookie of the Year pick. Um, he was mine too, dude. Yeah, he was my, like, yeah. But I don't know if it's going to stick with how the Buffalo Sabres have started this year. Uh, he gets, he gets fucking peppered, dude. Yeah. But I think you know? that, that was a big reason why I liked him. And I think, you know, obviously yeah. if that team makes the playoffs, like, cause, cause when you look at the Blackhawks, the, the blue jackets, the ducks, like, you know, those three teams most likely aren't playoff teams. Right. So right. I think if Levi brings Buffalo to the playoffs, just, you know, ups his odds a little bit more. Um, and then obviously, you know, I think it's, it's hard not to talk about Cooley. Um, I got to watch him the other night when the Coyotes were in town against the Rangers, and Cooley actually had a you know burst of speed by Keandre Miller, who is not an easy guy to burn. Right. Um, and Cooley looked you know unbelievably poised. Uh, he made a great play in the power play. Um, I believe he passed it to Schmaltz, who then fed Keller for a power play goal. Um, but yeah, Cooley's looked really good. I think I haven't watched much of the Devils yet, so I haven't really seen Luke Hughes. Um, but I know he's been up there as well. So those three, I would say, oh, I didn't even say Fantilli and, and, and Carlson, but um, yeah. I actually haven't really watched Fantilli at all either. So, uh, you know, I definitely got to watch a little bit more around the league. I've just been, you know, super swamped this past like week or two just with other stuff. Right. But, uh, you know, I'm sure I'll be watching a little bit more of those guys. But I'd say like Cooley, Levi, and, um, you know, Carlson right now played his first game, scored a goal, looked pretty good, are the three, I guess, outside of Bedard who should lead that conversation. Is it you know? Is there anyone that that comes to mind for you that's kind of like a dark horse that literally no one's talking about? I mean, for me, going in, it was a Zach Benson, and that was before even oh, yeah. the preseason started. And man, watching this kid in Buffalo at the prospect challenge, it was like him and Matty Savoy. It was like they were the two clear cut best players there. It wasn't even close for me. Mm-hmm. And so I, I was wondering if there's any you know any dark horses you have that of rookies that could emerge um, as the year goes on. Yeah, well, you took the words out of my mouth there with Benson. He was the one that I was thinking of. Um, yeah, I know. I know. There's. Who, I'm blanking on the name right now. There's a, a defenseman on Chicago. What's his name again? Kevin Kevin um, Korchinski. Yeah, yeah. He's he looks. I just watched, so I only watched the first two games the Blackhawks played the Penguins and the Bruins games, and I thought he looked pretty good in those games. Um, yeah, I, I was blanking on that name. Um, yeah, but I you know I don't know if he's like a dark horse because you know he's not going to put up. The, the numbers I, I think he's just a solid solid player he's a he's a brute dude like and again yeah. i think i think a lot of people I, I remember when the draft happened a lot of people were fucking mind blown that he went seventh and everyone was saying how how did pa- mintikov go you know how is he falling he only fell mm. to the ducks like two picks later but you're starting to watch this kid and he's just a brute big boy that you know he, he moves bodies and uh block shots he's a good defenseman and he he was one of my picks too like he he just look, he's not going to win the Calder by any no. means because he's not going to yeah. put up the numbers. But I think you know years to come he's going to be a solid defenseman for sure. Um, so I kind of I wanted to kind of transition a little bit to I, for me obviously I love college hockey, dude. And obviously we got to meet at the uh, UMass versus Michigan game, mm-hmm. um, which was fucking crazy because I chose the wrong one though. <laughs> I know I did, dude. Yeah. And I'm like I'm like watching this game. I'm like this is unbelievable. I'm watching that first line for Michigan McGrory. Um, you know, and those guys, I'm like, this is unbelievable. This might be the best first line in college hockey. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and obviously Emma, my fiance, she, she's a, a, you know, a, a, a UMass grad. And she was like, I've never seen it this bad. Like even when she was in school and then the next day, obviously, you know, Carvel must've tore into him a little bit and they came to play. Um, who are some teams around, you know, the NCAA that you think, you know, we have the obvious, the Michigans, the Minnesotas, you know, the BCs, the BUs. Are there any teams across the NCAA that really could make it, you know, make some noise and, and make, you know, compete for a national championship? So 
I haven't had the chance to watch them yet, and this is just like a dark horse. Yeah. Um, and I don't, you know, they're, I don't think they're going to come close to winning the NCAA championship. But apparently, Holy Cross is like a team that's you know kind of on the kind of on the rise. Yeah. Um, you know, I think their their head coach now is Riga, who was a uh, Pecknold assistant at Quinnipiac for a bit. Um, and, and I've you know from what I've heard, they're uh, you know a pretty strong bunch. Um, but I I haven't watched enough teams around college yet. Just because of everything in the NHL, I've only really seen UMass, right. Michigan, um, BC, and BU a little bit. Um, I'd say BC probably has the most top to bottom talent, at least on paper. Yeah. Um, but again, like I don't want to just bullshit you and say like there's some other team that I've seen because I haven't watched enough. Um, but obviously, you know the Minnesotas. Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure they swept St. Thomas in, like a pretty intense series last weekend or, or yeah. two weekends ago. Um, you know, I think those are the top teams for sure. But BC and BU are the teams to like. The Bean Pot this year is going to be nuts. Um, oh God, BC yeah. and BU is probably you know as good as this rivalry's ever been with the amount of talent that uh, that both teams have. Yeah, you know, and just the state of college hockey as a whole, dude. Like you're seeing, you know, just recently Macklin Celebrini. You know, Macklin. Yeah. You know, he's playing at BU. You just saw Cole Eiserman flip to to BU. Like the state of college hockey, it's become so unbelievable. Like, do you think there's what do you think is the main reason for this for this huge shift from you know junior to college? Like what what is the what do you think the um, like the reason for that is? Well, I think if you look at players that have dominated the NHL in the last decade or so, there's been a lot of guys that have come out of college. Like I think of yeah. you know starting with Jack Eichel in 2015. Um, you know, obviously he went to the Hobie as a freshman, goes into the NHL as the second overall pick. You know, obviously had his issues in Buffalo and whatnot, but, you know, he had a dominant, dominant freshman year at BU. Then you look at a guy like Cal McCarr, Adam Fox, Quinn Hughes, like Charlie McAvoy, all these defensemen in the NHL, it's the, the top defensemen in the NHL for the most part, all came out of college. Um, and I think that's a big reason why it's grown so much. And also, like, you know, I, I think a big thing about college is, like, kids want to have the chance to be kids. Like, you know, yeah. I think it's and – and I actually was talking about this – the other day with a, with a friend and I'm, I'm blanking on who I had the conversation with, but I was saying, I think it was actually Boone Evans, um, or, or Justin Selman, one of those two, they both played at Michigan. And I was saying that, you know, if you push back the draft age to 19, like you get these young kids to, you know, at least have one, like if Jack Hughes were to play one year of college hockey, like that would have made college hockey so much cooler and so much more yeah. popular. Like, you know, obviously Bedard played junior hockey and you know, it is what it is. But if you had Bedard like playing a year of, or one more year, I guess, of like junior hockey and whatnot. Like it just grows the popularity of the sport again. Like, yeah. um, you know, I, I think just allowing fans to pay more attention to college uh, is what's going to grow the game a little bit because, you know, I, I talked about this with Emily Kaplan on my Blue Crew show that a big reason why the NBA and NHL are so popular is because the popularity of college football and college basketball, because everyone's paying attention to the tournament. Everyone's paying attention to the college football playoff. They know who these players are when they get drafted. Like even if you're a third rounder in the NFL draft, like people know who they are. Um, and the NBA drafts only two rounds, but like people pay attention to college basketball and college football. So I think if you put more popularity on college hockey, it just makes the product that much better for when these players enter the NHL. And, you know, the reason, like I said about the popularity is because I think of, you know, the Kale McCars, the uh, Eichels, um, you know, those those guys that, that really stand out, Foxy's, uh, the Hughes, you know. Yeah, it, it, it's unreal. Like, in, I wish I gotten the chance to go watch that BU, uh, you know, national development game because obviously you you got the showdown of Celebrini and Iserman, then you got the, the Hudson brothers, and, and mm. dude, that national development team fucking whacks them. And, yeah. it, I, and you know, I know it, it's different night to night, anything could happen. That's why you play the game, but it's just been so exciting to watch like all these teams because this year, I mean, you could five, six teams, you know, that are really going to gun for a national championship. It's going to be, and then you mentioned the whole be or um, sorry, the, the bean pot, mm -hmm. which is going to be an BC, BU, Northeastern snow fucking slouch and Harvard too. And um, it's just going to be so fun to watch. Um, do you have any, do you have any picks for the, uh, for the Hobie Baker? Hmm. I mean, from what I've seen so far, like I, it's it's probably a stretch, but I love that kid, Seamus Casey. I think he's so sick. Oh I'm just so gross. Yeah, he's he's so sick. Uh, you know, but I've again, I've only seen like so few teams play. Yeah. Um, so I'll have to look more around 
you know, the NCAA a little bit as the year progresses. But I would say, like, the first guy that came to my mind was, was Seamus Casey just yeah. because he's so sick. We were talking about it at, at the game. Like, yeah. the, way, the way that he skates and just – like again, he he reminded me of like a Quinn Hughes. Yeah. Like just the way, like I literally saw glimpses of him, like how he just single handedly he could get the puck out of the zone himself, skating. Just I love watching the edge work and everything, and he's gonna be fucking special. The Devils got a good one, especially in mm-hmm. the second round, which is on uh, would crazy to think about again that this kid was a second round pick. Yeah, yeah, he's he's so fun to watch. He really yeah. is. The um, and then obviously we got to see you know that Rutger McGordy. Uh, he's so fun to watch too, man. He's a character, and um, obviously with Winnipeg, I, I think Michigan has a couple couple guys that could gun for that award. Um, yeah, McGrady was interesting though. Like, I I couldn't like tell like there was no player comparison. Like, you know, his, his skating is interesting. He, he's obviously got skill around the net and a good shot, but like, I I ca- I couldn't think of like anyone in the NHL who plays his style. Like, it's not like he was burning guys with speed. He's just a big, strong body that like just gets the job done. It might not be the prettiest, but like, yeah, you know, I'm sure he ha- he's had some flashy goals too, but um, it's funny. I actually was talking to like, this might be a huge stretch, but I was, t- cause I don't think he's as big, but like I was talking to Ben Holden who does play by play for the big 10 network and he's doing Michigan this weekend. Yeah. And he asked me like the same thing about McGrody. And I was like, honestly, he kind of reminded me of like Chicago Blackhawk, Dustin Bufflin, like just big power forward. Like, you know, doesn't like, blow you away with speed or anything but just like get shit done is like hard to knock off the puck yeah he and like again you bring up yeah he's a big boy like he wasn't overly aggressive Mm -hmm. but but like again in front of the net like he was yeah he was a big boy he was yeah showed some power in front of the net he showed a little finesse i guess but yeah i i i wanted to bring him up because i feel the same way i couldn't really put my finger on like what what his play style was like again Mm -hmm. he just was you you said it exactly that like he just got the job done like Got a good shot. He's big. Yeah. Hard um, to knock off the puck. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, the the other guy on his line that, that also stood out to me was uh, Frank Nazar. Mm. And he was another guy. I was – I couldn't really put my finger – like, he's fast. But, like, I don't know, dude. Like, he – something about him. Like, I know he's going to be – he got obviously drafted pretty high in Chicago. Like, I, I just – I thought I, I would see more out of him watching that game. And I know it was only one game. Yeah. Um. But I don't. I don't know. I couldn't. I. It was hard for me to find a player comparison for him too. I think he scored the second night um, on the power play. Pretty decent shot. But yeah, he he's got a pretty good. He's got a pretty strong shot. Smooth skater. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like I'm trying to think of a comparison to him too. Like I, I you know, I can't really think of one actually. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I I don't have anything off the top of my head. I I didn't really like. You know, I I thought he played fine. I, I didn't think he like stood out that much by any means. Brindley, I was super impressed with. He's a little speedster. Um, but yeah, no, I, I I can't think of anything for Nazar off the top of my head. To uh and then to switch it over to the UMass side, and obviously we're just talking about this game because that's you know where you know we got to meet up and stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I was really impressed with, you know, you mentioned the two obvious, you know, Ryan Ufko and and Morrow. I they were really fun to watch, man. And obviously they got, you know, they got burned pretty bad in the uh in the first game, but yeah. I, I think they're gonna be solid defensemen at the next level. Oh yeah, I mean Morrow is an interesting guy too because he's got so much skill and his size is like incredible back there. And yeah. you know he skates so well, and you know he's always him and Ufko are both always below the offensive goal line, which like you know you never really want to see as a defenseman, but like they have the speed and capability to get back and and not be burnt. So um, those two are super fun to watch. I think Ufko is just a little bit more uh, simple, I guess, than Morrow. Sometimes yeah. Morrow like, overcomplicates things a little bit, but he's got so much skill that like he can get away with it sometimes like his between the legs move. He tries to pull off a lot and it works, you know, most of the time, but other times it gets him caught a little bit. Uh, but his defensive play is super strong. I thought, and um, you know, coach Carvel talked about it a little bit in the press conference before the games this weekend that, or that weekend um, that both those guys like, you know, chose to come back for a third year just for their maturity level and to have a chance to be leaders and, you know, just to get a little bit stronger and a little bit faster. I know it's like a cliche thing to say about college hockey, but it's so true. Like sometimes, you know, guys do the one and done thing, leave a little bit earlier than they should. And, you know, it catches up to them a bit in the NHL. Like, you know, as, as good as Clayton Keller has been, you know, I think one more year of college could have just suited him a little bit better to get a little bit stronger and a little bit faster. Um, you know, he did the one and done at BU. But, uh, yeah, I think Ufko and Morrow are, you know, two incredible defensemen and two guys that could be on the Hobie watch as well, I think. Yeah, I agree, dude. And, and, and I really think they're going to be special to watch at the next level. The more that, you know, the more ice they get, the more time they get to develop. Um, 
I, I the last thing I wanted to talk to you about is this, you know, the segment that you do for uh, Bleacher Report, mm. the uh, the open skate. Um, and obviously, you know, you're you're a brilliant hockey mind. You know, you know your shit. And uh, talk to us about what that opportunity is like. I know, you know, video went pretty viral about you know you and Sid the kid, dude. Like, talk to us about what that opportunity has been like. The guys you've been able to interact with and what you've learned, um, you know, interacting with these guys. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I like I still pinch myself that I'm doing that. Um, to be honest. Like, you know, if you told me two years ago I'd be like skating a lap with NHL players, I'd be like, like, what the f-? like I like it's still, you know, it's it's something I pinch myself about for sure. And uh one funny one that actually sticks out. So I've done a bunch of them now, and there's there's more that I've done that are gonna come out as the year progresses because I did them all in Vegas uh during the player media tour. So yeah. we'll see some more come out over the next few weeks and whatnot, but Last year in the Stanley Cup final, I uh, had the chance to do one with Anthony Duclair. And funny enough, I sat next to his dad on the plane from Vegas to Florida. So we were kind of like getting a little rapport and I was asking his dad about like some fun facts about him and stuff. So that was cool. Like, you know, have the prior knowledge going into it. Uh, A lot of the times the questions are like kind of prepared from Bleacher Report a little bit because you want to keep them for the most part like open ended where you can ask some of the guys the same things and see the variety of answers. Like, you know, there's, there's one response from Cole Caulfield that I think will be like, what, the, like, how do like, what, like, you know, I think it just doesn't make sense, but it's hilarious. Yeah. Um, but the Duclair one, you know, sometimes I do them at the morning skate where there's actually like other people on the rink. So like, I have to like navigate myself around the practice. And this was like toward the end of the practice is prior to game three, the Stanley cup final. Right. I'll, I'll tell you. Okay. So, the Panthers are down to nothing. They're a little on edge. And I have like the video. You can't really make it out what the coach says, but like I'm skating around the rink with Duclair asking him these questions. And I go through a line in a drill and you, and you hear the coach go, get the fuck out of the way. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, du- Duclair was like, he's kidding. He's kidding. Don't worry about it. But like, I was like, oh my God, I just like disturbed a drill to see like a final, like, <laughs> like, what, like, you know, um, so that was definitely like a crazy moment for me, but yeah, I mean, getting to, you know, interact with like, you know, obviously you'd think that I was super starstruck around Sid and, and, you know, I'm not trying to sound like I don't get starstruck. Like I definitely was, I was the most yeah. nervous for that one by far, but he also credit to him, like couldn't have been nicer, made it so comfortable, like which, which calmed me down and didn't make me right. feel pressure. Whereas like other guys who I know, like don't love doing media stuff. It's a little bit harder. And, and that's where I'm a little bit more on edge. But yeah. when the player just like understands that it's kind of like a loosey goosey thing, it's meant to have fun. Like it's not really hockey questions. That's what makes it so much more fun and so much easier. And it allows me to be more of myself, which is good. Like I had a great time doing it with Willie Nylander. Like that was a blast in Toronto last year. And, you know, mind you, these, these videos like take probably like, three to five minutes and I like fly out for it. So it's kind of yeah. crazy that like, you know, I'll go on a trip and I'll do five minutes worth of work and that'll be it. And I'll head back to the airport, <laughs> um, which is crazy. But like, listen, I, you know, it's the best to me. It's like, you know, I don't know if you're a basketball fan at all, but like Jay Billis used to do that, like walk and talk segment on the yeah. basketball court. And I think the best thing about these videos and sorry if I'm rambling is just like, no, you're good, bro. The, the, the thing that I think hits home most with the players and why they're so receptive to it is because skating on the ice is their natural environment, right? Like it's where they feel most comfortable and where they feel themselves. Like you're not interviewing them in a locker room scrum in a suit with a microphone. Like you're kind of just having like a bro to bro moment of some sort, right? Where like you're just doing a lap casually, right? Like, um, and I try to emphasize that before we start the video, I'm just like, Hey, like going to be five or seven questions, like nothing crazy. Just like, you know, shooting the shit, like, just enjoy yourself, you know, like make it clear that like, it's not meant to be like a deep thoughted kind of thing. Um, and it's cool actually. Cause now, uh, who was it that recognized me? One player like kind of recognized me from the video. I think it might've been veneers. I don't really humble brag. No, it was someone. Yeah. Someone in Nashville, the draft was like, Oh, you're the guy who does those videos. Yeah. Um, which is cool. But yeah, I think, you know, listen, a, a lot of fans and including myself, right? Like I want to see more personality out of players. Like I want to know, like I learned more about Crosby doing that than I have like my whole life hearing from Sid, you know? Like, yeah. Um, so I think that's what's relatable and that's, what's cool. And that's why I'm feel insanely fortunate that I'm the one who gets to do it. Like I, I still like, I can't believe that I like was on the ice, like skating a lap, you know, with Sidney Crosby. Like I, it's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something that I'm very grateful for. And, and, um, you know, I appreciate you asking me about it, actually. Yeah, of course, man. It was it was funny because I remember I was laughing at the response. Yeah, Bleacher Report obviously posted, and you were like, "Yeah, it was pretty cool." 
Like, <laughs> I well, like yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, uh, I don't like to spoil the interview. You know? Yeah, no, I got you. And, and honestly, yeah. I think it's, um, I think for someone like I definitely can, uh, you know, appreciate like, you know, we want to get the other side of these guys. Like, you know, they, sometimes they can kind of come off as like robots and, you know, and, and it's understandable. Like a lot of these guys don't enjoy doing this stuff, but a lot of these guys have lives outside of hockey and, yeah. and have personalities outside of hockey. So I think what you're doing with this is, is so much bigger than, you know, I don't know if, if you realize, but like, it's so fun and, and awesome to see like the other side of these guys and like, you Thank know, you. see them laugh and, Thank so, you. I, you know, and honestly, it's I, I love the work you're doing and uh, I can't thank you enough for uh, for coming on here. Um, yeah. So for anyone that wants to follow uh, Johnny's content, um, you can follow him at J Lazzy 23. Um, you can also follow his pod account. Um, he's a host of uh, the Blue Crew at Blue Crew Pod um, covers the Rangers. They him and uh, him and his buddy Avery and uh, who's. You Cody, gotta know. You can uh, I'm, I'm sorry. You, you, you can disrespect Cody. Yeah, okay. I'm we, sorry. We do it all the time. I'm sorry, Cody. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you can follow them uh, again at Blue Crew Pod. Uh, they put out some awesome content, some hilarious stuff, man. I I know the clip you just posted had me fucking rolling yesterday. You're like, oh, the Knicks. No, thing. the fucking Knicks. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> He kills me, that guy. I love but that uh, guy. yeah, you guys, you guys do some awesome stuff, and uh, I can't. Again, I can't thank you enough for coming on and uh, taking time out of your day. Thank you, Chris, and same to you. Uh, great to see you grow and expand, and uh, you know, I'm sure this thing will keep blowing up. So, kudos to you, and thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Awesome, man. Thank you. Take care.